LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Doug Lane, who joins us to discuss his novel, Billy Moon, and some of the associated ideas and concepts. Billy Moon was Christopher Robin Milne, the son of A.A. Milne, the world-famous author of Winnie the Pooh and other beloved children's classics. Billy's life was no fairy tale, though. Being the son of a famous author meant being ignored and even mistreated by famous parents. He had to make his own way in the world, define himself, and reconcile his self-image with the image of him known to millions of children. A veteran of World War II, a husband and father, he is jolted out of midlife ennui when a French college student revolutionary asks him to come to the chaos of Paris in revolt. Against a backdrop of the apocalyptic student protests and general strike that forced France to a standstill that spring, Milne's new French friend is a wild card able to experience alternate realities of the past and present. Through him, Milne's life is illuminated and transformed, as are the world-altering events of that year. In a time when the Occupy movement eerily mirrors the political turbulence of 1968, this magic, realist novel is an especially relevant and important book. Hello and welcome, Doug, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Hey, thanks for having me on. Now, Doug... A few months ago, uh, you contacted me about um, your book, not your first, by the way, but your your most recent novel uh, called Billy Moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, you sent me a copy of that. And I have to confess that I thoroughly enjoyed the book. But that is the first novel that I have read for maybe six or seven years. I didn't think I'd perhaps ever read another novel again because I sort of told myself that I didn't have time because there were so many other pressing nonfiction things for me to read. So mm-hmm. perhaps as an introduction to our discussion, you could tell uh, listeners a little bit about the book. We'll get into that in detail and also about just your background and you know how you came to, to, to write in the first place. I'm going to start with your last part of your question first. And I, I came to be a writer a long time ago, back in the late 80s. I decided I was going to be a writer um, when I was in high school. And the reason I uh, decided to do that was because I, I had thought that I was going to be an actor and um, I didn't get the lead in the high school play, and it was devastating. And I figured if I couldn't even out-compete people in, in, in my own high school uh, for the school play, there was very little chance that I would be able to have the talent to be a real actor. So I decided I'll do something easier, which would be writing, <laughs> And uh, which, of course, it's not. But, um, yeah, so that's when I picked up writing. I had to get attention. You know, that's the kind of person I am. I wanted to be center of attention for and somehow or another writing is much more in the background but uh it's uh it was what i ended up pursuing now i'm really interested in in your uh so your your suggestion that you just thought you'd never read a novel again you know i uh i always feel that i need to read more fiction because it's what i do but i i find it's very easy to be attracted to um Books of nonfiction, for me, especially philosophy books, but also, you know, history and, and other kinds of nonfiction, just because it seems like it's connecting more to your life and these made up stories uh, that you read, especially if you read a bunch of novels that are are kind of all trying to feed the same thing, uh, you end up feeling like you're kind of wasting your time. So, like, you might, if you're going to read fiction, you might as well play video games instead. It's easier and more direct. Well, I suppose it depends on the, the author and their intention because some. Uh, novels are written purely for entertainment. They don't have to yeah. be bad novels if they're if it's pulp entertainment. They can be perfect. I read a lot of pulp science fiction growing up, was entertained, and it did feel like I learned I learned something as well. But mm-hmm. I mean, your novel, for example, it's clear that there's more to it than just uh, you know a quirky little story. There are ideas there 
um, how they come across and whether some readers pick up on them and others don't, that's another matter. But mm-hmm. you know, in that sense, the no- novels are a spectrum, aren't they, from just you know pulp nonsense through to something that can be really quite pr- profound and philosophically important. Yeah, I think so, but I, I'm not positive. You know, I mean, I'm I'm the kind of person that's always open to to suggestions, and I'm even willing to question whether or not writing literature or fiction is worthwhile. Um, and that and maybe this is a good way to to segue into what my book's about. My book's about a time in in history in May 1968 when students were trying to overturn the society they were in and uh, create a new kind of world. And that actually happened in in May 1968. There was a student and worker strike, and it looked like they might overturn the government. Um, But along with that, they were questioning all sorts of things, like, you know, what is the role of art? What kind of, what constitutes a film? You know, you can uh, look to Godard and see um, how he was involved in the the moment of May 68. uh, you know what? What kind of economy do we want to 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 set up, and what kind of world do we want to live in? All these questions pop up. So the question of is the novel even the form that matters today is a question. I'm you know I could kick it around. I, I'm not sure it is. I mean, but uh, it's it's what I ended up writing, and and I, it does help me think to to create you know coherent stories and and try to think things through. But the main thing for me with with Billy Moon writing this book was trying to figure out what was what went wrong in our attempts to create a better world back in 68 and and uh could what happened then be redeemed in some way or rethought well i suppose someone was lamenting online today i saw a blog post about people using terms like orwellian and they speak about novels like 1984 and brave new world and a lot of people aren't even aware that these are actually novels I don't know what they think they are in terms of concepts of where they <laughs> where they come from but th- right. those are clearly books that have been very important and even the last novel I read, which the, to the best of my recollection was The Penultimate Truth by Philip K. Dick, even that mm. is loaded with ideas that have relevance to the world and, and us living in it. Right. I mean, if, if you want to turn to someone who's, you know, can and it's easy to make the case that his work is relevant to contemporary, you know, 21st century life, I think the first novelist I would turn to is probably Philip K. Dick. I mean, he certainly the biggest influence on one of the biggest influences on me. I mean, there are a few others that came before him. I read, you know, in my teenage years and earlier. But um, in my 20s, I discovered Philip K. Dick and it pretty much changed my whole uh, approach to writing. And I was already wanting to be a writer at that point. But discovering Philip K. Dick um, really shaped me. And I think he asks the questions, you know, what is real? What is it to be human? Um, all of that kind of thing that, that matter most maybe today anyway. Yeah, one of my other guests, um, a chap called Anthony Peake, who I've had on a couple of times, he's just recently published a, a biography of uh, Philip K. Dick. I've not had a chance to read it or even get a copy yet, but um, it's something that, you know, he's the, the background that he comes from and what he writes about, the fact that he's doing a bio of, of Philip K. Dick is kind of significant in itself for the reasons that you just mentioned. Um, yeah. And I noticed in your acknowledgements list in the book, a couple of things that stuck out. Um, well, three yeah. things actually that resonated with me personally. One was Robert Silverberg, who people, if you don't know, is a sci-fi author. Because um, yeah. I had a couple of his books. Uh, I mentioned earlier reading a lot of pulp science fiction growing up. There was him. You then mentioned Jean-Luc Godard um, a moment ago, actually, but he's in your list. And he was a guy I saw a season of his films that were broadcast back in the late 80s on late night TV. And that stuck with me forever. And then there was Colin Wilson, who just, you know, someone I would like to be more like. You know, I wouldn't like to be as old as him. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. But he's someone that I read early on in life, with you know, starting with The Outsider. And he was a great influence, too. Did I mention Colin Wilson in my in my intro, really? I think I'm making that up because I thought that that's probably what I would do if I was writing a book. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> well, no, I mean, the thing is, it's perfectly legit for you to bring him up because I know who he is. And I I think well of him. I, I read some of his novels and... um. His book, The Outsider, is absolutely an influence on me, um, but uh, I just didn't know I had put him in that list. I in, when I was in New York City, you know, I went on a little tour, and when I was in New York City, I talked I talked to Mackenzie Wark, who's a nice guy, who's written a number of books about the same time period that I'm writing in with my novel, this May '68 moment, and he's reading that introduction, and he's just laughing. He says. You know, that I have a lot of nerve, you know, it's like, yeah, Karl Marx and, you know, 
this brilliant person and that brilliant, brilliant, you know, big icons of, of Western philosophy. I want to thank, you know, Socrates. Um, so he, he thought it was kind of a, a amusing um, list. And it was meant to be a little tongue in, tongue in cheek. And But um, yeah, uh, Colin Wilson, um, I think his, his work is definitely uh, worth reading. And I, I would say maybe reading as fiction, mostly. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think we've established now that neither of us actually know whether Colin Wilson's in your list or not, but he might be. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is Colin Wilson still alive? I you believe know? so. I, I believe so. I think I know about it. He died. I know that he did a little book called Super Consciousness a couple of years ago, and I picked that up. And then sort of some sort of serendipity, I just happened to stumble across a couple of podcasts that he was on talking about it. So as far as I know, he's still he's still clinging on. Well, that disproves one conspiracy theory, which is one that Robert Anton Wilson pushed, was which was that many people think that he and Colin Wilson are the same person, or thought used to think that. And uh, of course, Robert Anton Wilson has been gone for a little while now, but Colin Wilson stumbles on. So. He certainly does, and I'd recommend the, the book Super Consciousness. Actually, it's uh, it's quite an invigorating read, you know, quite inspiring. But um, what was it about um, Robert Silverberg then? Because all I remember is having his novel, A Time of Changes, but he wrote many, many uh, books. So uh, and he was someone that I remember just as a and other author. But then again, I've not read any of his stuff since the 80s. So how come he made your list? Um, you know, there's a really, uh, you know, there's a real simple reason why. It, the, I've read a few of his novels, like Dying Inside was one um, that I, and I liked them. But the reason he made the list for this book is because his book about time travel, I think it's called The Time Changers. I'm not sure. Yeah, that, um, that sounds about right. Yeah, it was, uh, which I should know that because it, it was featured in my novel. Um, the the characters in my book are turning to literature all the time. Um, certainly Natalie, the the main character, um, one of the main characters at, at Nanterre University. Um, she is using... Uh, Bon, uh, Bonjour Tristesse, uh, or Hello Sadness, um, by Francois Sagan, as a kind of a manual on how to uh, develop free love and, and be a liberated woman. And uh, so at one point, um, Gerard, he recommends that maybe they try um, a Robert Silverberg book called uh, The Time Changers instead of, of uh, Hello Sadness. Um as a manual for how to behave during a revolution. So that's why, I mean, the, the, it's his book is featured in my book, so I mentioned him in the introduction. In the uh, the book, the, the, the main protagonists, um, I have to say that I didn't really find anyone there that I'd want to spend a lot of time with. I don't mean I dislike the characters as people, but, you know, everybody's troubled on some level about something or other. They're all looking for something. And... I suppose that's, I mean, that's really a part of the main thrust of it, isn't it, really? Well, yeah, the, you know, just to write fiction, you have to write about characters who are looking for something. Maybe they don't have to be looking for something on the level of their basic psychology. I think the characters in my book tend to be, but you could just, you know, you could be looking for a treasure. But they have to be looking for something that they want. Um, but the other thing is that, my book is written from the perspective of the left, of the movement that I was writing about, of this movement for radical social change. And so the people who want radical social change are often, almost always, disaffected, alienated, and unsatisfied with the society that they're in. And, you know, there are various ways for that to manifest. And I think I, you know, wrote about that. Um, almost without much, without considering it very much. It was just, it was a natural thing for all these characters to be a bit uh, alienated from their everyday lives, from the, the life that they found themselves in. When I started to read the book, like most people, you just take things at face value. You think you're describing yeah. people and places and events, and you're thinking, you know, you're not even thinking, is this happening or not? Because there it is. But quite quickly, reality in its own way begins to break down in the mm -hmm. book and you realize hang on what's going on here and i don't know if there was any connection here but at points i just it reminded me of watching those jean luc goddard films and learning pretty quickly on in the series probably actually after, halfway through the first film to just stop trying to make you know rational sense of this <laughs> yeah yeah there's a dream logic at work in the billy moon it's not 
it's not uh, uh, you know the kind of logic that um, that you you that a realist novel would employ. It's it's dealing with things on the level of uh, of dream and and reality and um, ideology. So yeah, things don't always stay fixed, and you don't always know when you're dealing with the truth. Now, just to set out a few of the basics for people here as well, Billy Moon in the book. Is that yeah, we haven't we haven't mentioned Christopher Robin once yet. No, well, how is that possible? Plenty of time for that. But Billy Moon is actually the sort of nickname, as it were, of Christopher Robin Milne. He was the son of A. A. Milne, um, author yeah. of the Winnie the Pooh stories. Um, so now, what was your interest there, and why does he become the central protagonist in your book? Well, um, Christopher Robin Milne's father wrote the Winnie the Pooh stories with him in them, and the real man. Um, Christopher Robin Milne spent a good portion of his life trying to overcome or get beyond the image that his father created for him when he was a boy. So he really, more than even most of us, struggled to become a a mature man in the eyes of the world and in his own eyes. Um, He wrote a few books about this. and, And I think Maybe it's not so much that he struggled more than us, that he just had a unique way of and a unique set of challenges to try to overcome, and he wrote about it so well. So um, I read his memoirs, and it seemed to me that his struggle to kind of define himself against this fiction uh, fit with the way that um, the student wor- and workers who were o- trying to overcome the the university and then the society they were in were trying to redefine themselves as well and that so that the other thing though was that where, whereas the students in 68 were relying on their youthful uh, idealistic energy to try to overturn uh, the the gaullist regime uh christopher robin always cherished maturity and competency and realism and so he was kind of a force that it would be count, a counter force in the book. And also, if basically, if any of these students could impress Christopher Robin, maybe they had something going on, was kind of my thinking. Of course, because he, um, the real Christopher Robin, he signed up for the army, didn't he, and fought in the war. Yeah. And yes. So if he was struggling to become a man, I don't know, maybe that was part of an attempt to try and become one. Yeah, he wrote about that. He, he You know, at the moment when he signed up it was more that he just felt it was absolutely an obligation during the to defend his country at that you know he it came home to him that they were really under attack and that he had the obligation to go and defend this country i mean it's how he wrote about it and so um that the the it would be more in the details of like what he tried to do in the army that um and what and he did well kind of shows his attempt to become competent. He was an engineer. He built a lot of bridges, things like that. There's a poem by his father. I forget the, I can't quote it, but which describes um, a, a, a young boy, Christopher Robin, trying to build something with string and, and, and sticks and things and having it fall apart or not work. And that poem always really irritated Christopher Robin because he was very good with his hands and he could make things uh, with ease, it was, it was a natural talent for that kind of thing, and it was his father who always had trouble. And so his father was like projecting his own problems onto him in that poem, and the, the, so he write, wrote about that. Um, yeah, no, it, it, but he was a, he was a veteran for sure, and he uh, by the time he would have been in '68, he was never personally involved in the May '68 moment. I put him there in my novel, but he would have been 48 years old. He would, it was after, well after the war. He was a, a well established as a businessman. Uh, he owned a bookstore. Um, had a child, and a family. And you know, he uh, to get him in the midlife to go and invest in in '68 in the overturning of of society was something I, I was. I, if if I could pull it off, I thought it would be well worth doing. For those of us who don't know, how much factual truth is there in? In your novel's account of Christopher Robin's marriage and, you know, the child that they have, um, obviously the bookshop thing ties in, but it's, it, it, you know, it seems dysfunctional on some level, and I just don't know how accurate that is. 
Well, it, you know, I would say that's unkind to even my fictional version of, of Christopher Robin. That It's not exactly un- dysfunctional, but he has a, a child that uh, had um, autism is what I gave the child. And as a boy, the truth was um, his daughter had cerebral palsy. And I have no idea how they coped with it or what any of the details were about the kinds of conversations they would have about their daughter or about their day-to-day life or what, what kind of arguments they might have had or, or what married life was like for them. So I would say anything I put into my book about that was total fiction. But I did manage to, to, manage to pull some details that I twisted uh, from his memoir. So, like, he did have a cat named Hodge. I know a little bit about their bookstore. Um, uh, I know that he liked to go on walks. I mean, there are things that I can – I drew upon from his actual work to, to – help ground my fictional version um but i wouldn't say that the, the, his family was dysfunctional just that it was functioning in the way that uh, it had to based on everything not being perfect and based on the fact that he, he was a character who was fundamentally disaffected fundamentally alienated but his family was one of the things that he could deal with most easily Yes, no, I can. I would concede that that might be a bit unkind uh, i say you know this isn't scripted but um mm-hmm. perhaps I would say then that the the dreamlike quality of the the story, the things that happen, the things that appear to happen, things that don't happen, they make it all a little bit disturbing at times. So, you mm-hmm. know, so maybe there's a, a sort of a shadowy corner in the whole thing that we don't never really completely see, and and maybe that's where my impression came from. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are definitely some disturbing moments in the book, but I would say that you know if there's anything that kind of holds people together, it's a it's their relationships and their basic, you know, uh, caring and, and uh, affection for one another. Uh, uh, I think that applies almost across the board. The only person that might be a little deficient in that is uh, Gerard. Not that he's uncaring, just that he's so deeply into his own head and his own dreams and things that he doesn't take other people's emotions or, or needs into account that much. Yeah, what was striking about some of the student characters, particularly the two, the two younger ones, is, is just that. I mean, it's, it's how young they are and they've got this huge weight, you know, this sort of idealism and these philosophies that they're beginning to explore. And really, they're just, in some ways, you know, they're just kids. Yeah, they totally are just kids. Absolutely. But the thing that strikes me, I'm 42 now. Is that I, I, you know, every once in a while, it, I, I realize that I'm more mature than I was when I was 20. But most of the time, I feel like I'm coping with the same problems that I did when I was 20, only now, you know, without the benefit of, of being 20. So um, I kind of feel like uh, in our culture that we get stuck uh, at, at basically a struggle to come of age. And we spend our entire adult lives on that uh, pretty much. Well, on that note, what I read about A.A. A. Milne and his kind of how he lived his life, which in in many ways seemed to have been about perhaps avoiding responsibility is the wrong expression, but maybe not fully engaging in some ways with with, um, you know, with adult the life of adult male of his generation. I don't know if I'm expressing that very well, but it kind of resonated a little bit with me because I'm just one year older than you and I recognize in myself a desire sometimes subconscious to avoid certain things about adult life that appear to be unavoidable i guess without getting too personal about it i I don't know two cars mow the lawn on a sunday 2.6 children pension up the career ladder just all this stuff that um you know that modern life is supposed to be about right right well some of these things you want to avoid some of these things you end up avoiding by accident, like, for instance, a pension. It would be nice to have a pension, but I don't have one. Um, uh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. It, you know, I think there's a whole bunch of things behind it. it the, the, and it's not just, um, you know, uh, that you and I are rebels or something that, and we're avoiding. Because I think there's that, that's, that's kind of what I'm struggling with in this book, is it's this idea that not getting trapped and bound up in the culture uh you know, staying young and and, and relatively free um, of of those responsibilities is a way um, towards real freedom. But it, that May '68 kind of impulse, which I think is just what I is kind of what I just described, didn't fully work out. And 
what we really want is not to avoid the responsibilities and mature and 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 uh, objects of maturity that we are have on hand to us right now, but also not only that, but also to create something new, a new way of being mature, a new kind of adulthood, a new project for for what it means to be human. And and that's that's what I was struggling with in the book is how do we figure out how to do that? And that's why the book's so dreamy because you know you start questioning fundamentals about everyday life and you start to feel a little bit like you're slipping like you don't know where the ground is you know trying to take responsibility for the fundamentals or unconscious parts of your life you can feel a little lost and can feel a little bit like a philip k dick novel it's what i hoped i was accomplishing at, at times in that book yeah and philip k dick and for those who haven't read much or any of his stuff you really should but a, a more popular reference point perhaps being the movie The Matrix, and it's sometimes I personally feel, and I've talked to lots of people that feel like this, that that they are living in a dream in a way that and maybe that they would do some of the things that we were talking about, sidestepping or or putting off, if they felt more grounded, if they felt that what they were living in was real in some way. It feels unreal to me. Anyway, it, it feels like this isn't it. This is just a bit of it that we're seeing. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, no, that's right. I think that's really uh, central to to the feeling in Billy Moon. I mean, that's why Christopher Robin ends up going to uh, Paris, because the reality that he's in starts to show its seams, you know, kind of the same way that it did for Neo in The Matrix. He could tell that something wasn't right in The Matrix. And the same thing's true for Christopher Robin. Things start to happen that ought not to, if if the reality it was totally consistent and non-contradictory and, and solid um the difference between like my book and the matrix is that my book said the matrix says you know let's get out of the matrix <clears throat> and to reality back to reality my book says let's recognize that we're in the matrix and try to take collective responsibility for dreaming better it's a little bit different i'm not saying we need to wake up um, which is an odd position to take, I think. I think everyone naturally thinks, oh, well, the, if you're caught in the matrix, if you're caught in a dream, what you should do is wake up. But you lose out on a lot if you do that. First of all, I don't think that there's a ground to wake up to. I think that if you all you end up in is another dream. That it's like Waking Life, you know. Have you ever seen the movie Waking Life with Richard Linklater? Um, I haven't, but it's one of those ones that's been. Ref I've seen references to many times and thought, you know, I really should check that out. Yeah, should check one out definitely a great movie and uh big influence on my, my thinking and in that movie the main character keeps thinking he's waking up but then finds out again and again no he's still in the dream and i think that's our situation well um coincidentally the last two interviews i did spoke a lot about lucid dreaming and in those interviews we discussed the idea that where we are now the experience that you and i the consensus reality that we're sharing now as we speak is just one reality and uh, beyond our physical death, there's another type of reality, and actually it kind of never ends. So that lends credence to your idea of, like, it's not that we need to wake up. It's just that we need to recognize the nature of the reality, the reality that we're in and take more responsibility for it, particularly collectively, because a lot of the ideals, you know, about a good life that we kind of spoke about earlier, these things that people aspire to are often handed to them by, you know, third parties, quite often, you know, command and control structure that's quite often not, they don't see the real nature of it, it's truly in the shadows. At a simple level, it's, it means things like, you know, go to work so that you can go to shop and things like right. that, and then you die. You know, that that's handed to us, any you know, as a model for living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're not comfortable with that, right? I mean, I'm not comfortable with that comfortable with that what's what's weird is that what's handed to, one thing that's also handed to us is our discomfort with that our culture is really bizarre it's contradictory you know like most of the time most other cultures at least we imagine most of the cultures would say this is how you live and uh you know you would say okay and you take it on if you were a deviant you would say i don't like that but in our culture it says this is how you live and you should always question everything <laughs> this is how you live, but be a completely unique individual. It's an impossible commandment. It's a very uncomfortable position to be in. It struck me as well that the 
um, people are uncomfortable with change for any long period of time. Sometimes change full stop, but certainly change that's ongoing and grinding or, you know, a state of perpetual change, which you can think of like, you know, in a dreamlike quality to reality. And so many of the people in the Matrix, for example, they were, whether they were consciously content with their lot, they wanted things to be static and stable. They want to know what the answers are. And there's a lot of that, I think, in societies in general, whether it was the, the revolutionary, you know, fervor of the late 60s in, in, in Paris, a lot of people looking at these people trying to overturn things and question it and whether they could empathize or understand in any way what they were about. They themselves preferred that just, no, I know the way things are. Things will be the same tomorrow as they were yesterday and the same next year as this year, more or less. And that is a price worth paying. <coughs> That's but I can't, I can't see how anyone – sorry about the coughing. I can't see how anyone really believes that because if there's one thing that's consistent, it's all the change that we get all the time. You know, People didn't – 10 years ago – yeah, even 10 years ago, people weren't staring at their phones while they were walking around. You know, they had cell phones, but they weren't staring at them all day long. Well, I suppose you know? there's there's change like that that's sort of I mean I wouldn't call it organic because again they were these in this case where these consumer products are coming from is a whole other matter but they feel it, that's change it takes over a sufficiently long period of time and they feel that they've benefited from it somehow even if they've just been told that mm. they have and it's one of the you're right you are right uh, as much as people try and avoid change you're absolutely right it's constantly happening because it's one of the things that we have that change is the only constant you know and i think that's why people can be so unsettled and dissatisfied because that is the reality but they're trying to live in a static existence where every, almost everything anyway can be predicted you know and factored in right yeah and well, but i think that a society of constant change and one where every individual is responsible for his or own her own um uh, choices and then creating his or her own meaning in life is actually the one that seems to be fixed and I think it's actually relatively recent to development you know so we, we again it's this weird thing where <clears throat> on the one hand the culture that you seems to be saying oh yeah do the same things every day but on the other hand some of the most conformist parts of the culture say be a maverick do it your own way change the system fight the system but those, you know, it's like you can be a millionaire <laughs> is kind of the, the other part of that. So you can win. At, the game itself never changes, but you have to change all the time in order to win. Now, I mentioned a moment ago lucid dreaming, and we see an idea came up in the your novel uh, where the, some of the characters are getting to reality testing. And yeah. it's, again, it's never particularly explicit what's going on, but they're sort of saying, you know, look at this, uh, you know, look at this clock and see if the time changes and you read the details on this piece of paper, do the words stay the same. We're getting this impression, again, that this is, increasingly as you go through the book, that this is a dreamlike reality these people are in. What are the implications for that? So what's the, what function does that have um, within the overall uh, narrative? Well, it, you know, the, the book itself is a fiction. And as such, it's, it's a dream. My mother read the book, which is uh, unusual. I guess it's because because it came out from a major New York press. She was impressed, and she read. It. And she wrote me, and she asked, "So, at the beginning of the book, is that a real cat or a dream cat? How soon does reality start to break down?" And my answer was, "Well, as soon as you start reading the book, you're reading a fiction. So you're in a dream from the start." And the the whole point of this book, because I aim I aimed at getting the reader to be somewhere close to the same state of mind as the people who are trying to overthrow the Gaulish regime, this kind of revolutionary state of mind, okay, associate with with lucid dreaming in a way. Um, I wanted to get the reader to that, pers- to that perspective, so I keep telling the reader that they're reading a book or that they're, the characters are a fiction or that the, the story is a dream and that things don't quite work out. But but I want people not just to know that about my book, but then to take that and, and apply it to their lived experience as well. Okay, just to zoom out a little, perhaps, you mentioned to me that the idea that lucid dreaming, Christopher Robin, Winnie the Pooh, via your book, some of the, there could be some ideas here to, uh, your words were, help us get out from under modern life. 
Um, and that certainly that resonates with me because out from under something, it's a weight, it's an imposition, um, it's obscuring other things. What were you thinking when you when you wrote those words? Yeah, get out, get out, help us get out from under modern life. I think the thing that we are constantly trying to to, to find in modern life is the source of our reality. Like, uh, rather than accept that we're dreaming, like it. Well, it's like kind of like this. If you're if you're lucid in a dream, you can fly. But if you are convinced that the dream is entirely real or mostly real, or if you if it's if you're not responsible for it anyway, your options are much more limited. So if we understand that the social system that we're in, the kind of society we live in, is our dream, then we have much more of a potential to change it. Yeah, and I think we're encouraged to believe that we can't change anything fundamentally, and. This is we're encouraged to think this by people, I would say, you know, organizations, whatever institutions, but they're all made up of people as well. We're encouraged mm. to think we are powerless by people who boldly shape reality. I agree. But, you know, those people that boldly shape reality are always doing it in the same kind of way. Like they're always doing it in the in the service of uh, profit, mostly. So their thinking is completely structured by this the dream that they're already in and they take that dream to be real just as much as anybody it oh, just uh, happened i think oh no you're absolutely right and by no means suggesting that these people are uh, you know paradigms of virtue i mean everyone we all have, <laughs> right. our own, have our own ideas in our minds about who these people are but you know yeah it comes back to this thing like you said earlier that uh uh, that you know, people want something fixed and they want to live their life every day and be cons- cons- like know that next year is going to be like the, this year, and and I said, oh, but but the one thing we know for sure in this society is that we're going to face constant change. Um, that's like true, and then but at the same time, I'm trying to advocate change, uh, but change on the you know one step down from that, not the kind of so that w- the the change would be that we would know we would be in control of how our society was changing and, and what we would change the terms of our society. And I think like, you know, you're absolutely right. There are these elites that control reality. They can determine what kinds of books we read. They can determine what we're watching on TV. They can determine what, what we're eating every day, but they can't set the terms. We, we all have to do that together somehow. And that's, that's the weird part. And I don't actually know how to, get that to happen or and may 68 was a moment where everyone in, in paris anyway and most of france tried to set reset the terms of their life and it didn't ultimately succeed but it was a very interesting moment well it occurred to me when you were speaking there that the the the, the, the diet of tv and tv dinners and general narcissism that is what's at the root of i don't know about you but me personally kind of to an outsider seeming to kind of drift along because I, I want, I can't even put this into words, I don't think adequately, but I want the flexibility to be able to go with this constant change or go against it, whatever seems to be right at the moment. And a lot of people I know, they don't have that anymore. They're entirely caught in the dream of the 2.6 kids and 2.6 <clears> cars. <throat> I always wonder what 0.6 of a child and 0.6 of a car look yeah, like. Yeah, I, I happen to have uh, 2.6 kids, and the 0.6 kid is my favorite. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> um, no I, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. There, are, It does seem like a lot of people um, are struggle. Basically, the struggle for most people is to just continually accept what they've been given. So we're struggling to survive all the time. And... You know, it's not it's not that people are happy so much, but just that they are working really hard at convincing themselves that they are. Uh, so, like, I'm in. I, have you heard of this? Um, I, I've been taking a class on Open University. I'm the kind of person that will sign up for a philosophy class online, uh, even though I have no time at all for that. But just because I want to listen to the lectures, so I've been listening to the lectures about Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard said something interesting. He said. In our society of narcissism and nihilism and meaninglessness, the first step towards uh, a, a, a treatment is uh, another malady, which would be despair. So mm. if you're feeling some despair, you're actually maybe on the right on the road to uh, overcoming meaninglessness 
according to uh, Kierkegaard. And uh, maybe that's what, what you were talking about at the beginning here, just with my characters in this book. There's maybe a sense of despair in all of them. Yeah, I think so. And again, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, I think I've taken back the thing about dysfunctional, but it was that affected, definitely affected the, the you know, the, the color and the character of the experience of reading it. And I suppose I'm always counseling against despair, even though I, I, I deal with people, you know, daily, weekly, you know, good people, uh, not professionally, by the way, just, you know, colleagues, whatever, people expressing despair for whatever reason. And it's it's not... I, I might want to counsel against it and get, I would like them to move beyond it, but I understand that it's something that they need to, to, to move through. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure what Kierkegaard means when he says despair. You know, when these guys talk, these philosophers, they, they sometimes use one word, but mean a whole slew of other words. But yeah, it's not just sadness, right? It's this sort of sense that there's no solution that within what you're living with way out there's that you're going to have to do something um completely radical in order to break free something that will maybe shatter you in the process have you ever seen you ever heard this uh 1969 television show by jim henson called the cube i haven't but i know jim henson was an, an interesting character you know above and beyond the muppets right he was in the 60s he did some experimental uh films and he made called the cube about a guy who was trapped in a, a white cube with no doors and his whole the whole show is about him trying to figure out how to get out and by the end of it it's also who he was you know what's and what re- was real and what was not and it's done by jim henson so it has that kind of sense of humor to it it's a very funny little 45 minute sketch um but uh, i kind of feel like when you recognize that you are in a room with no doors uh, that you're trapped in a cube. That's that's the moment when you might be able to break free of it. Until you recognize that you're not going to get out of there. You're going to be stuck in that cube. You have to have that moment of despair, of recognition of, of your circumstance. Well, there's a bit of a staple there in science fiction and fantasy of of people living in a reality that's something other than they believe it to be and they don't recognize it. And then, you know, that we spoke about the Matrix earlier. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of things like that. And in fact, even... That was one of the major themes of the last novel I read before Billy Moon, which was, the, you know, um, the penultimate truth, Philip K. Dix. It was as a, an entire world of people believing that reality was something, you know, 180 degrees from what it actually was. I haven't read this one. One Philip K. Dick book I haven't read. I've read Ubik and um, almost, almost all the you know, Ballas and the Transmigration of Tim, Timothy Archer, but I've never read the penultimate truth. I have to pick that up now. When yeah. did you read that book? Uh, when did you say? Yeah, yeah. 2006, 2007, maybe. I can't quite rem- exactly remember. Yeah. Did you like it? Was it oh, yeah, yeah. Book? I loved it. It was. I could, I could see where it was going, uh, you know what I mean? But that's probably because I've read so many sort of dystopian, <laughs> you know, science right, fiction right. novels that right. they do tend to have uh, common themes. So have I convinced you that maybe reading a novel every once in a while is a worthwhile endeavor? Probably, yes. And I should know this because some of the <laughs> some of the biggest ideas that I've carried through life have come from... People, you know, the, all the sci-fi classic authors, all the well-known ones, you know, Robert Heinlein and um, Brian Aldiss. These are people that I was reading in the 1980s. And they, even if they're writing about fictions, it's amazing how much of it has a relevance, you know, really in, in yeah. life. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a big fan of Heinlein, actually, too. And um, after I finished the novel, it was about to come out, I decided to take a bit of it that I didn't. I, there was a bit I wrote for the novel that didn't stay, that didn't fit, you know, like it ended up on the cutting room floor, like in a movie. And I decided to take that that footage or that writing and do something. And I rewrote it, and I rewrote it based on a, trying to do the same thing with it that Heinlein did in his short story by the by his bootstraps. So I just really made it about time travel, which is not it's kind of in my novel billy moon but it's just very much in the background and then this little short story called um natalie's paradox uh it's it's in the foreground and i hope to have that picked up by somebody one uh, thing you also said uh, in, in your email to me was uh, there is something dangerous about poetry and something real about the imaginary and if we are to get radical changes the sort of thing we've been talking about we must mm-hmm. stop seeking solid ground and start taking our fantasies seriously. Now, that's very interesting 
uh, sequence of words and are very appealing because, you know, that reminded me of the, the dreamlike nature of the book. And I also have a thing of being not only quite comfortable with, but quite enjoying the fact that I'm not really sure what's going on and I don't actually know what the fundamental nature of reality is and, and that we may never know ideas that people are quite uncomfortable with. So perhaps you could just say something about that idea and just explain what you mean about the dangers of poetry. Yeah, well, you know, uh, the the May 68 moment had a history behind it, and one of the uh, major influences on uh, the the students and the th- and some of their professors and some of the thinkers behind the students um, was surrealism. So, one way of thinking about this May '68 strikes and and attempt at revolution was that it was a an attempt at a surrealist revolution. Surrealists were radicals. They were they were not just artists, but they wanted to take their art and put it in service of revolution and service of creating a new life, and they very much had a love of the dream as a, something that would be counter to um, the kind of drudgery of everyday rational life <clears throat> under capitalism. And so uh, I absolutely wanted to embrace that same aesthetic and the same politics of, of the surrealist revolution in, in my book and put that out there for people to reconsider again as something that might have some power behind it, that there, that it, it's not just a, it's not just something that would look good on a label for a soup can or, or something, but that the surrealist impulse is dangerous and can lead to a new way of living. Dangerous for the system as it is. How and why is that? What is subversive about it? And how might some of the ideas behind that actually manifest you know, within the sort of the boring everyday consensus manufactured reality? Well, one way is that, you know, it's harder and harder to make the case. I mean, back in the 20s when the surrealists were on the scene, the society they were in hadn't already absorbed their aesthetic and their approach and, and their, their uh, you know, this was pre-rock and roll. This was pre-MTV. This is pre-2001 um, by a long shot, but both the movie and the year. It, so... It's harder to make the case now that surrealism might be subversive, except in so much as that most surrealism or most kind of strange dream imagery or or that whole aesthetic of, of unreality that is out there, pretty dominant right now, most of it takes for granted that, that it's only a symptom of, of something more fundamental. And <clears throat> so the kind of dangerous thing would be to realize that this unreality is actually – is the basis of life and that we are free to to make to make changes not not in the way that you know you sometimes hear like um like from the people who wrote the secret when you take a look at something like the secret the secret is saying oh your thoughts will bring reality um you know into existence and it's somewhat true that our thoughts do that but our thoughts do that through collective work through you know social work it's not that we do that like a, oh, like a comic book character or a magician or something. So, um, so there's that. The the other thing is that it seems to me to be this underlying support for the secrets. Like there's a realm which has an infinite amount of say love in it, and if you just are pure enough, it, that realm you might call it God will give you what you what you're thinking of. And what I'm saying is there's a realm of infinite contradictions just like life. And it, the kind of unreality, this sort of brokenness that you feel in your life now, it really goes all the way through from the top to the bottom, which means that you can change things. You can set up your life in different ways. But you don't ever have anyone to turn to who's going to be the one who, who really knows or who really has it all figured out for you or any life force that you can just simply pay alms to or – to get what you want you're going to always be working with a, a world that's a little off off center and recognizing that is um the only hope we have of, of maybe having some control over the way we shape the world i did an interview um a while ago with a psychologist called kirby surprise this is real name by the way and he wrote mm-hmm. a, a book on synchronicity and we discussed at length this idea about thoughts creating reality and there, there was a lot of stuff out there that's talking about that very literally you know, if you go to bed at night just thinking about 
you know, the BMW and the yacht or whatever that, you know, this stuff is going to magically turn up. And he poo-pooed that completely whilst, whilst acknowledging that we do have an effect on our reality and it's more to do with our focus. And I do not need anyone to tell me that this works or it doesn't work because I've seen it in my own life and it, it, it makes sense in a way. And there's some science behind this as well, that what you focus on, it, you're more likely to, if not manifest, and you're more likely to, you're more, literally more likely to notice it. You know, it's the red car syndrome. You know, you decide mm-hmm. you're going to buy a particular color and model of car, or you do buy it, and next thing you start seeing them everywhere. And that's to right, do right. with that's to do with where your thoughts and therefore your focus is. And this can have real effects in your life. It, it can mean things, simple things like, you know, you're not meeting someone that you otherwise would have met who would have been a destructive force in your life. And instead you meet someone who's a positive force in your life or that you end up, you know, getting a job that's fulfilling or as opposed to having one that's not. And outcomes like that, in my personal experience, can be affected by, you know, your focus and whether that focus is positive or negative. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. The the other thing I would just point out is that, you know, um, well, in Western philosophy, there's been this division between thought and action that's kind of plagued thinkers for a long, long time. And trying to work out what that relationship is uh, has been a project for lots of different thinkers. And the the guy who I like best to try to work this out is Hegel right now. And his solution is that uh, it's kind of like a Philip K. Dick solution. There's a... Um, there's a little short story Philip K. Dick wrote of the electric ant. And in it, um, this uh, the main character discovers that he's an android. And they, so and he discovers, he opens up his chest and he discovers the paper ta- tape loop feed that's going through him that gives him his perceptions. So the holes in the paper determine what he sees, Right. So the material reality of his, of his folds in his paper, but then he has the experience of a whole world in his head. So there's the thought and, re, and physical reality kind of seemingly opposed. But then he's looking at that paper feed, so the paper feed is also a perception. And he can poke holes in the paper feed, and then like when he pokes a hole in the paper feed somewhere else – Strange things happen in the room, like a flock of ducks fly into the room. And he decides, finally, that he wants to get rid of the paper feed and be, you know, really see things as they are. And when he does that, not only does does the world disappear for him, but the world disappears for everyone in the story. And it's written in the third person, so it's kind of interesting. That the relationship, this sort of twisted relationship, is the relationship between thought and and. Uh, body mind and body if you don't have the twist you know if if it isn't the case that the paper is also a perception as well as being the material foundation if you don't have that twisted quality to reality if you try to flatten it out and just have reality known directly everything falls apart the, the world disappears kind of twisting kind of going off course even that uh, the paradox the contradiction that gives life uh it's sense of being solid well where i'm at i am right now um at age 44 i think i think it's good to not keep too close to track on your age but i'm pretty certain it's 44 <laughs> um it seems to me that the physical the material is not the fundamental ground of reality i don't know what is but it seems to be immaterial it seems to be closer to thought I would agree with you, but I think it, that the danger there is not to recognize that you've got to have that, that basically it's, it's this relationship between the material and the mental and the way that the, there's a strange loop there that is kind of the, it seems to be of thought, but it's also of matter. It's, it's a very odd thing. So, um, and I, and the, the being odd, it gives me the opportunity to try to explain it again and again and again and write books after book after book about it, hopefully. So. <laughs> well, it's like it's like time, isn't it? You know, no one has got a clue. Uh, right. not, not Stephen Hawking. 
Uh, not no one has got a clue what time is, but you know, sir, you know, a lot of work being done on that and a lot being written about it. <laughs> Just to get sort of almost practical uh, as we you know begin to bring things to a close for today, mm-hmm. we've been you know been bouncing around a lot of philosophical ideas, and we talked at the start and we've alluded to it a couple of other points about addressing actual problems that we have in the world as it is today, whether our perception of that is cloudy or not. What would you like to see change? I mean, there's a litany of problems we seem to be facing at the minute, and some of them do seem to be terminal. And certainly, even though there's been for as long as, you know, re- recorded human history is uh, out there, there's been talk of, you know, the end times and what have you. But we seem to be on a number of fronts, many fronts, actually, building to a sort of culminating to a head where things really can't go on. And again, that has been said many times, you know, something has to give and then it doesn't. We just bodge it and carry on. But mm-hmm. a lot of the interviews I do are about people who are concerned of whatever their specialist area is, that we have reached the limit here on whether that's somebody talking philosophically, spiritually, or very, very practically in terms of, you know, environment or economy or whatever it is. And the, the need for change, the desire for change that comes across in your novel really resonates with a, how a lot of people are feeling who I talk to day to day, whether it's interviews or whether it's just, you know, colleagues and friends. What did what I like would like to see is something like what happened in 2011. Um, I thought the Occupy Wall Street movement and all the different movements around the world that, that happened in 2011, uh, whether it was in you know the the Middle East or the the Arab Spring or if it was in Spain or uh, the UK or Canada, I thought all of that was really positive. What we need to what I want to see next is to do something like that with this dedication towards um, thinking through the system that we're in more. Rather than coming together for collective with a collective feeling, I want to come together with a collective thought, you know, fairly rationally discussing and, and working out what the moment is that we're in. Um, you know, this is I, I'd, I'd love to see the, the philosophy take the streets uh, instead of poetry this time. Um, I don't know if that's you know likely to happen, but I I think that would be useful, and uh, and that's uh, maybe philosophy and literature. I'll, I'll throw in some stories to you know a spoonful of sugar. Well, it does seem that people need or want some new way to look at you know where we are, some new ideas, some new lens to look through, you know, some new perspectives, because it does feel that we're you know traveling in circles or down cul-de-sacs dead ends you know coming back to the same point again and again and that a new, perhaps a new way of perceiving things could free up a lot you know some some new insights to change the way we look at things flip them around and maybe at some uh, you know a whole new world of possibilities could open up in addressing issues that affect us whether it's individually or collectively and whatever that new vision is going to be one thing that i'd like it to everyone who has it to keep in mind is that it's a human construct that, you know, we're looking through a lens. It's not that um, we've found the way things ought to be, but that we've created a nifty way to look at the world, a better way for now. And that I think would be worth, worth doing. Well, Doug, before I let you go, um, I've got, again, we've been talking about lots of things, but uh, centrally about your recently published novel, Billy Moon. Two things I want to yeah. ask you about. One is what is it with orange? In the book, uh-huh. you've got orange uh-huh. soda, orange wallpaper, orange paint, orange carpet, orange polyester, an orange kettle, orange lilies, which, by the way, are my favorite flower. You've got orange spice. You've got oranges with cream, no less. You've got an orange sky, an orange space suit, an orange carpet. Oh, we had that earlier, didn't we? With two orange carpets. Yeah. Yeah, an, orange, or- an orange tricycle. I'm not finished yet. An orange tricycle <laughs> and some orangina, which is brand placement, I reckon. <laughs> that's great um well i don't know many other colors and so whenever i need a color i just reach for orange no um let's see the, the, oh, okay the thing about the orange carpet i always write about orange carpet in everything that i write i always make sure there's a room with orange carpet in it um and i do that because uh in tribute to the band negative land who has a 10-8 place and part of what it was like done as a spoken word kind of choose your own adventure story, this one big long song. And you, one of the things you had to do was uh, clean the dog juice off the orange carpet. 
in that song. And so somehow the orange carpet just got drilled into my head. Um, but orange itself, I don't know. I think it's a lovely color. It's my favorite color, I think. I didn't know that until just now. But, um, you know, a really good orange movie is The Last Tango in Paris, by the way. There's a lot of orange in that, I think. I, I am, uh, you know, I just, I think that if maybe I should make films so that I can just make everything orange in my movies instead of having to use the word over and over again. Be much more. But yeah, I wanted uh, Billy Moon to be an orange book. And this from Wikipedia, uh, munchies are a type of confectionery produced by Nestle. Uh, they mm-hmm. were introduced by the British firm Macintoshes in 1957. The brand was later acquired by Nestle as part of its takeover of Roundtree Macintosh in 1988. The original variety of munchies are individual milk chocolate coated sweets with a caramel and biscuit center. Now, these things were my absolute favorites in the 1980s. So what is the significance, if there is any, in the munchies wrapper in Billy Moon? The, the munchies wrapper. Well, the munchies wrapper has a l- number of levels to it. One is that <clears throat> it represents this kind of mass produced culture that's being come, that's coming in after World War II that uh, that Christopher Robin is not quite acclimated to um, that he's, he's struggling with um, and that he's also an, an, a commodity in himself as a, you know, a Disney character. So the Munchies rapper, I think, shows up. You know, he has to fish it out of the river there, and um, it's just it's pollution. Um, so there's that, and then it also turns into a reference to a, a Winnie the Pooh story because he puts it in and takes it out of the wastebasket over and over again to test whether or not he's dreaming or not, kind of, and um, uh, which is very similar to what uh, Eeyore t- does in one of the Winnie the Pooh stories with a broken balloon, putting it in and taking it out of a honey jar because he's doing that object permanence test himself the way a child does. And finally, what's the significance of the mud? Because there's a lot of mud in the book. People dissolve into it. It crops up in unlikely oh. places. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, that is a reference to the dream time, um, the aboriginal notion of the dream time. It's the moment when the animals uh, moved across the land and, and cut it into its shape. It shaped it, made, shaped the mountains and the valleys and the brought the trees into existence and so forth. So it's that primal moment before time, something unshaped. Well, Doug, there's so many little nuggets and ideas and bits of philosophy and concepts in Billy Moon. We could, you know, we could carry on talking all day. But uh, mm-hmm. before we bring things to a close, perhaps you'd like to share with listeners information about your other books you've got out there, your website, and of course you do a regular podcast yourself called Diet Soap. Yep. So, um, you can find out about my website and my other books at douglaslane.com. That's D-O-U-G-L-A-S-L-A-I-N. My last name is Lane and it's spelled L-A-I-N. Um, douglaslane.com. You can um, find Billy Moons on at Barnes & Noble, um, uh, probably at your local library, especially if you're if you're in the U.S. at your local library, perhaps not if you're in the U.K. or Europe. You can find my uh, other books like Wave of Mutilation, which is a novella, or Fall into Time, which is a short story collection uh, on Amazon. And real recently, I had my first short story collection, a book called Last Week's Apocalypse, come out on Audible. It's a really top notch, kind of pro, pro level reading of that short story collection, and I'm quite pleased with it. So if you go to Audible and type in Douglas Lane or look for Last Week's Apocalypse, you can find a uh, a reading of my book that makes it sound even better than it really is. So I recommend that. And of course, Diet Soap uh, information is all available at your website too. Yeah, and it's Diet Soap uh, is the name of the podcast, the Diet Soap podcast. And it's also at Podomatic, dietsoap.podomatic.com. Excellent. Well, Doug, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Hey, thanks for having me on. It was great. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please check out the website, that's legalizefreedom.com, legalize-freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy, and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.